Um, for those of you who don't know, Citizens Online are a digital inclusion charity and our work is to ensure that no one is left behind in the digital age that we now live on, live in. Um, myself and James will be managing the session today and our uh, contact details will, will be at the end. Um, and as Nick said, please do put your, your questions into the Q&A um, and any comments and things into the chat box. And we certainly want you to be involved, so we'll come to those later on. Um, we're going to tell you a very short overview of our approach to digital inclusion. We're then going to cover lots of tips and help and resources for supporting people with digital skills remotely at the moment, because obviously with COVID, it can't be done face to face. Um, we're then going to go to the Q&A um, and answer your questions and get your thoughts and feedback. And we'll wrap up with some resources. I think Nick might have said as well, the session is being recorded, so that will be up um, later as well. So as most of you probably know, the people who are most likely to be affected by the coronavirus, um, people who are older with long term health conditions, um, people who are shielding, those key groups are also more likely to lack digital skills. Um, a lot of the help and resources being offered to people at the moment to get them through the crisis are digital ones. So clearly this is a problem. Um, things especially like you know being able to register for priority shopping deliveries, uh, claiming benefits as well, it's all online. Um, so if you're stuck in the house and you don't have those skills, um, it really is quite worrying at this time. So at Citizens Online, we've been working on digital inclusion since the year 2000. And we think that to really have a good crack at improving digital skills across a locality, across uh, an area, we think you need three main things. Um, firstly, a partnership. Digital inclusion is, is uh, quite a problem that's well entrenched. Um, people can be difficult to reach. Uh, so we think the problem is too great for one organisation to solve on their own, which is why we advocate working together. And what you generally find in an area is there's a lot of organisations who are interested in helping people with digital skills as they transform digitally. Um, digital champions are what we know is the best way to help people with digital skills. So that's a one to one approach. It's very personalized. Obviously, it's quite resource heavy. So that's another reason to be working in partnership. Um, digital champions could be volunteers. They volunteers often work out the libraries, for example, and help people with uh, digital skills problems. Um, they could be members of your staff. So they might uh, work in a customer contact centre and again encourage people to do things online um, or they could be paid uh, people as well who do this as part of their job. Um, you know, uh, banks often have community digital champions um, and yeah, that kind of uh, that kind of role. Um, and also, we think it's useful to have some kind of maps or evidence to know how to target your resources across an area as well. So those are the three main elements that we would recommend um, as the most sustainable approach to trying to tackle this problem of improving digital skills. And as we know, um, sadly, the problem isn't going away. Uh, although there are more people clusters online these days, um, the the, the things that organisations demand from us is technology moves very quickly, get more complex. So actually, there's still a lot of people, 22%, who lack all five essential digital skills. So I'm going to follow on from what Heron's been talking about by focusing a little on some of the mapping and evidence work that we've been doing lately. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we released a map of the GP surgeries in England um, with reference to the age and digital exclusion risk that we could sort of interpret. Um, unfortunately, the data is only for England. We are looking into doing similar things for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but that depends dependent on available data. 
what we've been able to get from NHS Digital is information about the number of patients at each uh, GP surgery, which is displayed on the map by the size of the circle, as in the example. Then we've looked at the age profile, which gives us some indication of risk in terms of COVID and digital exclusion. So the circles that are more darkly colored, closer to purple, they have a generally older profile. Um, and that's in our algorithm, it's weighted particularly to the eldest groups, which are most at risk of COVID and least likely to be online. Finally, we've made the map have two layers, which you can turn on or off. Uh, one is the surgeries where over 30% of patients have registered for an online service. And then the other, which is what's highlighted in the screenshot you have there, is places where less than 30% of people have registered for an online service. Now, there are a few caveats that's around this because people might not register for a service simply because they're quite able of, to walk into the surgery or phone to book an appointment or um, get their prescriptions or look at their medical details. Um, and also some people might be using a third party system that isn't counted in the data to do this. However, we think this is one way that we can identify places which are more likely to be um, ones where the local population is digitally excluded and you might want to contact that GP surgery either about providing them with some support uh, when they're trying to get people to use their online services or ask them how they can signpost people to you when they come across people who are who are struggling to access their services. Um, we've also been developing maps for uh, local authorities for a long time. We often do this through contracted work and we're still available to do some of that. Um, but because of the crisis at the moment, we're trying to develop some free resources that are available nationally. So on the screen, you can see an example of a map we're producing for Brent at the moment. Um, this breaks down Brent into a number of what are called lower layer super output areas. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that term, but perhaps not all of you. Um, and those super out, those LSOAs nest into things into the council wards, which are the black boundaries on the on the map. What we're doing with these maps is combining a number of measures which we think indicate greater likelihood to be digitally excluded, covering connectivity, whether people have access to super fast speeds and 4G, uh, age, as we've talked about already, uh, disability, we know that disabled people are much less likely to be online or to have digital skills. And we also look at things around qualifications and degrees of social isolation, whether people are living alone and they're therefore less able to rely on a, someone else living with them. Um, we're, with our map that we're developing, we're going to be covering the whole of England and Wales um, and the LSOAs, or, sorry, the wards will be divided into 5% uh, ventiles, they're called, where you'll be able to see which wards are um, most at risk within England and which wards are most at risk in Wales. So we hope that's something that will be useful to you when you're trying to target resources or identify places that are at greater risk. Thanks, James. So we know um, through talking to a lot of local authorities who we work with, um, you know, the response to the COVID crisis has been amazing and the speed at which everybody's, um, you know, jumped into action is, is really something to be applauded. We know that it's been all hands on deck with uh, staff ringing people on the vulnerable list and asking them about their essential needs. What we're not hearing as much of, which we, we'd really like, is to be also included on that list of essential asks for people to be finding out about their digital capability as well. Um, we really think you're missing a trick if you're not finding out, you know, if people are confident to do things online, if they have some kind of device, do they have Wi-Fi? And there's a great opportunity to start somebody on their digital uh, journey. So, we mentioned uh, digital champions, or you might call them digital angels, digital buddies, online advisors, um, a whole different range of names for people who are confident to help others with their digital skills. Usually this is done face to face. Um, obviously at the moment you can't do that. So there's an additional barrier of trying to help somebody with a device over the phone um, is the most common method. Um, there are a lot of video conferencing tools that can be quite helpful as well. But of course, first, you've got to get that person who you're trying to help. You've got to get them to connect um, on the video tool. And, you know, we use Zoom a lot. That's one of the most popular ones. Um, WhatsApp, you can also do video calling, obviously, FaceTime, Skype. 
Um, I helped a learner quite recently. She had a, a smartphone with WhatsApp on the phone. So then I, she was then pointing it on her laptop so I could see exactly what we were trying to do on the laptop um, because actually trying to describe this work over the phone like I say it, it's it's really difficult and speaking to a lot of digital champions they much prefer to do this face to face but it's not possible at the moment um, so actual screen sharing software is is very helpful as well and a lot of them are free for uh, ad hoc kind of use. Some of them have charges if you use them regularly. If you have IT support that's remote, they usually use them regularly. Um, but that's another very useful way of actually, you know, taking control of someone's device. And then you can try and set it up in a way that's a lot easier for them to use. That might be, you know, making the text bigger or saving some of their uh, links that they might use to favorites or saving them on their desktop etc um, but what you have to have before you get to that stage obviously is quite a good level of trust with with your learner digital champions um, if you are sort of thinking about launching some sort of program or, or trying to, to find these in the local area, something that we just wanted to stress and remind people is the biggest skills that these kind of people need are actually people skills. You don't have to be a technical whiz to do this kind of work that we're talking about. We're talking about help, helping people with very, very basic uh, online tasks. But what you do need is you need to be able to explain things very clearly to people and be really, really patient. Um, when you're helping somebody with uh, their first online journeys, it is, you know, it's easy to forget how to do those things. It's things that we take for granted. But if you're 72 and you've never used a computer, you're not just going to uh, pick it up in half an hour. You're going to need another follow up session the next week, ideally, to sort of repeat where you were going and there'll be questions that come up. So patience is really the main um, the main thing that you need to be a champion. Um, you need to constantly be very encouraging for people as well. Um, you know, people, people don't like not being able to do things um, and they feel very foolish as well when they see their, you know, small kids around them being whizzy on the iPad and things like that and they find it very difficult. So um, it's just good to encourage all the time as well. And avoid jargon and try to use the terms that the learner knows and understands. Um, Quite recently, again, I was helping a learner and uh, I was referring to the return key. She didn't know what on earth I was talking about and she knew what the enter key was. And it was just, you know, just simple little language things like that uh, make such a big difference when trying to, um, to get someone online. I think we mentioned as well that, you know, getting somebody online is quite an individualized um, hook we call it so for some people it might be you know researching a family tree online or they might be interested in skyping their granddaughter in australia that kind of thing and um, the covid crisis has been a really big hook for people uh, we've certainly had examples of um people who have had no motivation to use the internet whatsoever and you hear that a lot of you know i'm 63 i've never used it why do i need it now um, went to people actually going, oh, I'd love to see my grandkids or it would be great if I could get my prescription online or whatever it is. So it's quite a big hook for people. Um, we've got a few ideas for, you know, tools and tips and ways to start people uh, throughout this presentation. So right now, with everybody stuck at home, um, certainly people want to be doing fun things online. Uh, you know, the range of digital programs that you can get online now with uh, online streaming services or, you know, radio, you know, the, the range is, is just huge and uh, online gaming on house party, etc. Uh, and Kindles and audiobooks and that kind of thing. There are just loads and loads of things to keep people entertained if they can get online. So I think that's quite a good way to start somebody on their journey. And as we were saying, imagine if this had happened in the 80s and we only had 
four TV channels, what would we do without Netflix? Some of the other things that obviously come up a lot of this time are accessibility settings, which are often helping people who, whether, they're dis whether they consider themselves disabled or not, maybe having issues with their sight or want to control their device in a way that doesn't require use of their hands. So um, uh, we partner with a group called AbilityNet. They have a good set of resources on a website called My Computer My Way, which covers, amongst other things, just basic access to accessibility settings for whether you're using an Apple, uh, Android or a Windows device. Personally, you know, I'm I'm 35 and I find most of this stuff really useful. I find the default text sizes on my devices is often too small for my preference. So this stuff isn't just for people who are disabled or certainly not just for those who consider themselves disabled, but very useful for everyone, particularly older groups. Oh, we Sorry, missed one yeah. there. That's I, both, I, of, both of us I, clicking I'm the button. Obviously, at the moment, reliable health information is really important, and there are a couple of things that you can do to help people access that. So one is obviously to point them to the NHS.UK website, but even without getting into that level of complexity, people, a lot of people who are um, over 65 do use WhatsApp. It's one of the most popular things for people in that age group to be using. So you can direct them to the Public Health England or World Health Organization apps. Um, they just need to send a hi message to WhatsApp numbers and they can ask questions and receive answers. It's a sort of bot based system. Um, it's worth mentioning that the World Health Organization's system works through many different languages. So that might be useful to people in your uh, areas who, are, who don't have English as their first language. Following on from reliable health information, it's worth mentioning that there are unfortunately a lot of scams around at the moment and misinformation circulating. Um, a few quick links that you might be interested in. Age UK have a long running scams and fraud system and information about where people can go if they think they have been scammed, which have got a useful updated web page on coronavirus scams that are circulating in particular. And finally, there's a bespoke fact-checking service alongside the others like fact-check and full fact infotagion.com provides specific information around coronavirus sourced from the world health organization uk and other government advice uh, similarly to accessibility settings one thing which obviously comes up is security settings a lot of people who have not yet been online are not online pr primarily or in part because of their concerns about privacy and security so this is something which is really important to address carefully with learners in a way that reassures them and gives them a sense of control rather than makes them scared about the online world and decide not to engage with it at all after all. So it needs to be broached carefully, this conversation, but there's lots of useful um, resources out there. The ones uh, here are, again, for different devices or different um, operating systems available from our partner Digital Unite. I think over to you, Helen. Yeah, sorry, back to me. Um, so we mentioned uh, getting people a connection as well. It is a barrier. It's expensive to get online. And um, so, it, you know, people on low incomes really do struggle with this. And although we mentioned older people before and uh, disabled people as being some of those offline groups, what we know from the current crisis as well is there's a lot of um, school age children children who uh, are at a huge disadvantage because they can't get online at home and even if they might have one device between three children etc um, if they do have a device and a lot of young people used to use you know free wi-fi in um, in mcdonald's or the community center or the library and of course none of that is available at the moment um, so there are some tips here for some uh, low-cost options um, and also BT do an offer called BT Basic. There are some caveats around um, the type of people who can get BT Basic. So you need to meet certain criteria beyond certain benefits, et cetera. Um, but it isn't particularly well publicized. So we always like to, to make people aware that it is there. It's still 10 pounds a month, but it's a lot better than uh, some of the offers out, other offers out there, uh, which, are, which are more expensive. So that's um, the end of our slides. So we'll just cover what's a few things that have come up in the, the chat. Yeah, so uh, as 
has been often the case, Helen, you won't be surprised that we've got some questions about um, what happens with accessing someone's computer, remote control of someone's computer. In specifically, the question here is about issues of liability if something goes wrong, but I know we've had we've previously had lots of questions about this aspect. Do you want to start and then I can add anything? Yes, I will. Could I just um, just say to Nick as well, though, we've got um, someone who's struggling with their sound and video and I'm trying to help them a little bit, but I can't I can't do that while I'm doing the questions, Nick. So I don't know whether you just have a minute to sort of give them a, a link to help with their sound and video. Thanks. Um, yeah, so safeguarding is something that comes up a lot with digital champion type work. Um, we always recommend that anybody who is a digital champion is working through an existing organisation. So, for example, volunteer as a digital champion is the same as volunteering anywhere, really. So they, you know, quite often the idea PBS checked um, and they are working through trusted sources under uh, guidelines and of course they've been um, vetted in some way as well. Um, we don't know, personally, I don't know of any um, incidences that have happened, but um, it's open, isn't it? And, and we can see that it's just potential there for somebody to take advantage. In part of the training that we always go through with uh, digital champions, you know, we, we are warn, warn people about sensitive information as well. For example, helping people with banking. Um, we always recommend that people go to their local bank service for that. And they have community bankers who will help um, people with their online banking because that's particularly sensitive. Um, but it really is just about putting those sensible safeguard and measures in place that you would with any other kind of volunteer and scheme. If um, for people who are trying to help people remotely as well, they're more likely to engage with someone if they are working through a trusted source. We wouldn't recommend to anybody to just, you know, somebody say, no, I can help you with your computer and just come some complete stranger. Usually it is through a local authority or a, you know, a community group, a church group or a library. Uh, or a bank. Banks are quite keen on this work as well. Yeah, just to add to that, really, we, we, we've one of the things we've suggested is that if anyone were to use the remote control tools, that they do that after having already built up a relationship with the person through a number of sessions uh, that depend on the specific learner and whether they were being helped prior to COVID face to face. It's harder to build up that sort of trusting relationship over the phone. But um, nonetheless, we think it's possible. The other thing is uh, emphasizing things like most of those remote control um, apps are based on a sort of password system that has a time limited password, making clear to learners that that's the case is really important. Um, yeah, I think those are, are bits, bits of advice. Obviously, you know, there's a limited number of cases where that's really necessary as well. So trying to um, restrict to either simply sharing a screen visually, but without adding the remote control, or um, as Helen described, using one device to um, show video of another device's screen. Those things can make a phone call much easier to, mm -hmm. to offer some advice. I've just seen and in terms of language, sometimes it's helpful if a, if a learner is describing themselves what they, what they can see and what they, they want to do. And then you can pick up on how they refer to the things that are in front of them. I've just seen in the chat as well, um, Helen Leach is, is just flagging that City of London libraries are offering phone remote um, help. We'll send that number around. And also there's an organisation called AbilityNet. Uh, they also have a national free phone helpline. Usually that helpline is for people who disable people to get help getting online. But because of the crisis, they're offering their volunteers um, help with anyone. So that's a good place to signpost to if you don't have a local digital champion program. I know that in some areas of the country, um, there are more localised versions. So for example, in Dorset, they have a phone line that people can call for help and they'll get referred to a vetted digital champion. I know in Nottinghamshire as well, um, there's a scheme through Connected Nottinghamshire that has that number. But the ability net number is um, national and uh, be, be wonderful if, if the government would do something like that as well. But um, 
no signs. As you yeah, I'll just, I'll just, um, I've just posted the um, mobility net helpline number in the chat. Right. I'll just read it out for anyone who's watching the recording and wants to um, give them a quick call. It's 0800 048 7642 if you want to speak to ability net about. Um, and if you are help. from an area as well that you you know about um, some kind of, of digital help scheme that we haven't mentioned, do let us know and we'll certainly uh, promote for your area as well. Yeah, that would that would be really helpful actually. Um, we had some other comments. Yes, I was just um, Helen's comment about um, the staff going away, researching a problem, then they phone the person back and set up a Zoom meeting. Um, one of the things that we've talked about on one of our previous sessions is alternatives to Zoom. Uh, partly that's because of the kind of security questions it's raised. So obviously it's worth highlighting that when you set up Zoom meetings, you can do that with passwords and with registration even in order to prevent people you don't want to be on the call joining it. Um, and you certainly shouldn't be publicly sharing your, your Zoom meeting links. But another alternative is to use a service like Whereby, where you don't actually need to download any kind of app or anything, and that can be helpful to people who are perhaps least familiar with doing that kind of thing. Um, with Whereby, you just send someone a link and they're able to access a video conference. Um, we talked about that more previously with diversity and ability, and they have some more advice about that in a video on our, on our YouTube channel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lee Emery is commenting that Stockport Council, um, that's where I live, I'm in Stockport, um, have given tablets to all care homes so that workers and residents can keep in touch, which is amazing. But they've also asked them not to do online banking because it is too, sen too sensitive. And um, obviously, if you're sharing a device, then you, you never want to leave that kind of history on there. Um, I know that there's been some fantastic volunteer schemes, especially around Stockport as well. Um, and there's a lot of community groups have, have whipped into action and keeping in touch on, on WhatsApp um, and trying to get the help out to people. So that's really good to hear. Um, yeah, while, while we're on the subject of um, devices, it might just be quickly worth mentioning the devices.now initiative yeah, that's run that's by future.now. I'm sure most people listening will have heard of that already, but just in case not, they, um, they are supplying devices via the UK online centres network. So if you have registered online centres in your area, then you may be able to contact them about um, what's happening to those devices. They have said that they might be opening that scheme up to other organisations as well. You can currently kind of register to be on a waiting list if they move into a into another phase of distributing devices. Um, we've got a comment as well that in Liverpool they're setting up a face-to-face -face service. Something that we should mention as well is um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Learn My Way, which has some excellent online resources for learners. There's also a platform called the Digital Champions Network. And at the moment, they are offering some free licenses and this uh, training on there for digital champions. So everything that we've kind of mentioned of, you know, helping people with who might be visually impaired or working with people with memory loss, getting all the people online, uh, digital champion essentials. They have a whole range of online courses. Um, so we'll put the links into that as well. So anybody who's thinking of setting up a program might want to refer your uh, potential champions to do a bit of online learning as well. Um, and Tracy Boffy is saying that Wigan are also rolling out a digital champions program. And they're starting from the age of 15. Has anyone had any issues in terms of parental consent and safeguarding? Um, we um, always advocate that, as I said, the volunteers or the digital champions work through the policy of the organisation. So if, if I can't see whether it's Wigan Council, but if it is Wigan Council, it would be their safeguarding policy that we would advocate sticking to. So if you cover and then you're insured and you know your policy covers 15 year olds, then it's not a problem. If it's from 16, then we would recommend just going from, from that age. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it's probably worth at this point, Helen, showing some of these other resources. We can still have more questions come in in the chat, but should we show you these last few slides we had? Oh yeah, sorry, I completely um, forgot about them. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so uh, on our website, which is citizensonline.org.uk, we have a page, coronavirus support resources. This is all sorts of things that we've collected from around the web, which are either about helping people stay in touch with their family or other people, or about how you can help other people to do these sorts of things. So whether you are the person needing some help or whether you're providing help to someone else, um, then you can 
access all sorts of things on there. Importantly, quite a lot of it is less about helping people with digital skills, but about you know new styles of remote working. There's quite a lot on there about uh, device um, uh, devices and uh, video conferencing. We've also got a blog focused on helping someone take their first steps online, which has got less of that stuff about remote working. It's more about the kinds of things that Helen was, uh, Helen and myself have been talking about today, getting those hooks um, and signposting to some of the guides that are produced by a partner organization called Digital Unite. I think we've mentioned them already. I'll just show you this other slide, which, which talks about the things that they've got on offer at the moment. So one of those is what Helen talked about, free digital champion training during the coronavirus pandemic on the bottom right. Uh, that's access to the digital champions network that Helen mentioned, which has got a whole suite of not only resources, but tools to manage projects. So to help you monitor um, the learners that you're helping. Um, there's information about safeguarding on there. There's lots of lesson plans for people and things like that. They have specific top tips for people who are working as virtual or remote digital champions. And they have a set of guides and resources that they've identified as being the most useful during this time. Things that people are most likely to need help with, like health information, for instance. Um, something else that uh, I wanted to mention was um, we talked about connectivity being a problem. And as we said, not just for older people, but especially for kids who are being homeschooled at the moment. Um, I've heard about a project um, in one of the London boroughs, I can't remember which one now, um, where they are working within uh, a couple of tower blocks in an, in an estate to provide free Wi-Fi uh, during this crisis it, it may even be extended if it's popular um, and it's a partnership with the housing association the local authority and a couple of um, broadband providers it's community fiber and hyper optic there i think and the free wi-fi is being underwritten by the housing association at this time so i just thought that was a really interesting scheme i will pick up with them and try and share some learning with that um you know and if anybody else is knows of anything similar as well of trying to get people connected um we'd really like to hear about that so is there anything else in the chat i think we've covered most things that i can see yeah Sorry, James, are you saying, I can't hear your sound, James. Sorry, yeah, uh, I think we've covered everything. Lee, I noticed you said the mapping would be really useful earlier. Is are there any questions about that or comments on how you can imagine you use it, Lee? Let's see if anyone says anything. Otherwise, perhaps we should wrap up. Yeah, thanks very much for your time, everyone. As we said, it's been recorded. We'll send round um, the slides and the stack of resources. There's our contact details. Please let us know if we can help and please do share uh, successes as well. As I said, we, we want to uh, share learning is, is the main objective, really. So, yeah, thanks very much for your time. And thanks that's for great. Nice, Nick. Yeah, that's great, Helen. That's great, James. Thanks, Thank you very much indeed.